In the year 21X, Lord Boxman opened a store to arm his robot horde. But the heroes of Lakewood Plaza are ready to fight! Kaylee and Enid are in battle for one more chance. Kaylee and Enid are in battle for one more chance. Podcast. Oh, I bet we can fail you way more times in this week's episode of Lakewood Podcast Turbo. I'm your host, Wyatt, and kick my butt? Huh, my two pack is touting the 12 pack. And who is here with me today, as always? It's the number one Raymond fan, Buster. Hey! And who is our very special guest for the first time on this podcast? Yo, what's up? It's the Sugma Mail, Tom, Tommy PQM. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sug Sugma Mail, you know, that's your, that's, you have a YouTube channel. Uh, yeah. Sugma Mail. That, I have two YouTube channels, actually. That are Sugma Mail related. Uh, <laughs> well, one is, one is Sugma <laughs> Mail, which is where I post, like, my higher effort, like, edited long form content mm -hmm. and then i have tommy pqm oh where every yeah. week i just do i just do like a desktop just like Shit. talking into a camera rambling Shit. whatever i had no idea that <laughs> that's all you know what there you go so go check that out if you're a big fan of the sugma mail extended universe then you can check that out uh you also are or were i don't know for sure if it's continued uh, frequent collaborator with the round table uh and have yeah you mentioned before in a previous life uh, uh you know we're going to pretend like we didn't fuck up a recording and then had to do it again here yeah this is the first time we're doing this <laughs> yeah uh, that you were you did some okay ko stuff uh on yeah the round table so why don't you tell us a little bit about your history uh with okay ko well i have been following it technically since the beginning cool probably not since the pilot yeah, i don't yeah. think it's been a couple of years mm -hmm. but once it started airing on cartoon network i was following it especially since you know on the round table our bread and butter was kind of steven universe yeah so ian being part of steven universe and then moving over into okko it's like all right this is yeah. way up our alley yeah it was like steven and star right like i remember because like every single time i talk about in a group chat that we're in, I talk about Star. Kevin shows up and it is like types in all caps about yep. how, how season three is secretly the best one and how season four ruined everything and is the, the worst thing ever made. <laughs> but like, yeah, so, so, uh, you know, I did, I personally didn't learn. I was probably like around when maybe when Amphibia and uh, Owl House and or like think Amphibia because that was 2019 is when I started paying attention to the round table. Um, and yeah. I, I fucking love Amphibia. So, uh, we, but we will get to that in some other point. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we all were big giant weeaboos, right? All three of us. Uh, I imagine we all have <laughs> some type of anime character as a profile picture. What are you talking about? I, I don't know any Asa Chainsaw Man. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I haven't actually started part two of Chainsaw Man, so... One Piece is an anime. That's true. It, you know what? It's more like European cartoons, because uh, that's what Ichiro Oda was inspired by. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, One Piece actually is very similar to OKKO OK in a lot of key ways. Yeah. Uh, in that, like, they've it feels like it's like very worldly you know <laughs> in that it's like inspired by multiple different uh facets of like cartooning and animation and things like that uh yeah. you know that the anime hasn't gotten there i don't think but you know especially when you get to like gear five yeah and he turns into like a, a steamboat willy era like ru rubber hose sort of cartoon character just like you know tom and jerry style hit somebody in the balls with a hammer yeah. Uh, kind but of going full force of the loony, and I love it. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, that was kind of present in the beginning. Mm, they kind of oh, moved yeah. away from it, but like early One Piece, you definitely look at it and you're like, ah, oh, this is Popeye. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like some of the character designs, uh, and like some of the like just the the situations that they're in. I think like 
what's so appealing about one piece is to me you know i like a variety of tones i like it when uh, maybe one thing i like about anime is that it can take something that's extremely serious make it goofy but then make it serious again and just like keep making something dumb and cool over and over again in like an infinite roboros loop you know uh like gurren lagan my favorite anime <laughs> yeah uh is like so ridiculous and so stupid and over the top but then it's like it's actually awesome while being so stupid but then it's also like emotional at the same time and has like a gripping story and serious stakes uh, like it's just so like complicated of a stew you know of all these different ingredients you know i love things that can kind of like be really atmospheric and stay in one tone for the most part but i do think like tonal variety you know that's like the it's the spice of life yeah. you know uh to me like shows like okay ko uh really appeal to me because they can capture the real essence of i think what makes like anime and like japanese uh, media and stuff great as opposed to just like superficially uh copying it yeah. you know like something like i don't know like some of the stuff in the mid 2000s you know we, there's great stuff like avatar of course but then there's some lesser stuff here and there stuff like some French shows like uh, Totally Spies and, and Martin Mystery and stuff. Kappa Mikey. You know, I, I know like yeah, some people Kappa like Kappa it, Mikey. but like some parts mm. of it feel like, eh, is this racist? Yeah, it's just, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> that, that's a problem. That's a problem that uh, continued for a shockingly long time is uh, some of the that racist. Like I remember watching back during the lockdown at work, uh, you know, we were just we worked at as janitors in a school. So like we had nothing, literally nothing to do all day. So we just watched cartoons in the basement. Based. Uh, so we watched all of my life as a teenage robot. Great show, but wow, there was some racist stuff in those episodes, like with Asian people and everything. And it made me realize like, man, I feel like these kind of like ridiculous caricatures if done with like any other race, would be horrific, you know, to, yeah. like, the level of, like, stuff from Looney Tunes in, like, the 40s. Yeah, But, like, it was bad. just okay. I'm looking at you, Mario. Yeah, it was just, well, look. <laughs> look, Italians can't, isn't are just another Pratt. form of white people. They're fine. Isn't it, yeah, isn't it funny that, like, Italians are, like, that's the last bastion of racism. Like, everybody's like, but it's okay if we stereotype them, right? And they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, sure. Fine. That That's... I'm sure some Italians are upset about uh, Mario's portrayal, but it's just, like, the most important video game character of all time is, like, this absurd cartoonish stereotype of Italian people. Uh, and now he's Chris Pratt, so, you know, the, look at this fucking hell that we live in now. Uh, uh, a blue-collar working Italian, too. That's true, yeah. <laughs> and as a New Yorker, uh, you know, I do I do live amongst many Italians. Some of my family are Italian, you know, so, you know. Well, well, I'm part Sicilian, cool. so it's like, some to some that means I am Italian, but to hmm. actual Italians that means I have a full pass to just be racist towards Italians. <laughs> yeah because <laughs> we are quite at odds with each other yeah it's like the turks and the greeks mm -hmm. yeah and, and like you know let's talk about family lineage here the you know my mom's side of the family is russian jewish so i ha you know that's like a very i'm a very new york person you know part italian part jewish you know russian as well so it's just like i'm, I'm all that stuff I'm, I'm i'm a man of the city uh but <laughs> But yeah, so I think I think OKKO manages to tap into the zeitgeist of like anime yeah. without being embarrassing, like Kappa Mikey, without being racist, like Perfect Hair Forever, you know, or, or things like that. Yeah. Uh, it, it is able to like portray the multiple different tones uh, of anime because these two episodes are like very tonally different, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't feel dishonest uh, compared to. Uh, you know, the the rest of the show or, like, the, the style of the show and everything. Um, so the first one, Sibling Rivalry, boarded by Dave Allegri and Heiwan Lee. Uh, for my money, these two are, like, probably the most wild storyboard artists uh, just to put pen to paper as far as 
uh, making OKKO episodes. David Legri, I've, you know, I've followed him for years now on Twitter. And, like, he just has, like, such an interesting, like, weird, like, not, like, his art style is, like, so not conducive to animation. And yet it just works. Like, there's just something about it that works. But, like, if you see, you look at it and it's like, okay, that's good for, like, a webcomic or, like, a drawing, like, a funny doodle or whatever. But there's no way you can make this work, you know. Looking at his, uh, like, sketches and drawings on the OKKO wiki to get, like, a reference. Yeah, it does Mm -hmm. feel, like, very, like, crude. Like, these facial expressions he draws are, like, really, like, oh, like, how do I put this, like, not gross out, but, like, kind of disgusting. Yeah. Oh, he drew one of my favorite frames in the show of, like, Mr. Gar's meat, meat nipples. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the there's just something, you know, about the style that, uh, I don't know, it, like you said, it looks like sort of like... That surreal mm, imagery. Uh-huh, and, like, kind of 90s, sort of, like, edgy, maybe, like, Ren and Stimpy, or, yeah. you know, that kind of, like... Uh, that kind of style, the gross out humor, like you yeah. said, but like not doesn't like go too far with it. I think like they're like they can reel it in when necessary, but like most of the time when you see like oh it's Dave Allegri and Haywan Lee, the episodes are just gonna be crazy. Yeah, uh, and there's a lot of crazy visuals in it, especially when you mm-hmm. got Raymond, the best character in the show. Well, not the best character, yeah. one of the best characters <laughs> in the show. He's in the top Def- five. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We. You know, I love all the box spots. You know, they're just like such a fun part of the show. Yeah. Uh, R- Raymond is definitely like the most, like, he's pretty unique compared to some of the other ones. Uh, you know, like, you have Daryl, who's voiced by Ian, yeah. and then you have Shannon, who is voiced by Kari Walgreen, who is, you know, famous cartoon voice actress, but. You know, has done some anime here and there, but is mostly, like, doing cartoons. But then Robbie Damon, voice actor for Raymond, is, like... uh, I wonder if that was intentional, that they're like, oh, we're going to get a guy whose name sounds like it's Raymond, right? Like, Robbie Damon Raymond? I don't know. Uh, Maybe they named him after the fact. They're like, oh, we got this voice actor. Yeah, whatever, Raymond. Because it's the fusion of your first and last name. (laughs) But, uh, you know, he's he's an anime, like, forward voice actor, you know, and he's done, like, video games and anime and stuff like that. I know, like, Persona 5. Yeah, uh, Akechi, Goro, the best yeah, character. As, as sketchy Akechi, uh, you know, is, like, bam, that, that's, uh, and that was, like, earlier the same year. Yeah, you like, know? So that was, that like, was, like, like Persona April 5 just got localized around the time mm. the show came out. Yeah, so it was like an awesome, it felt like, oh, this is, you know, my brother, a huge fan of Persona, so when I was watching it with him, I would point at the screen and soy out, you know, <laughs> and be like, whoa, it's the guy from the game you're playing, you know, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, that does sound kind of similar to Ashley Birch, who voices Enid. That's true. Because I know she's mostly known for her voice acting in video games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she, she's like, Ashley Birch... It's so crazy, like, how much stuff she's in now. Uh, Whereas, like, back when OKKO came out, it felt like, oh, cool. Like, the the voice actress from, like, (laughs) Tiny Tina and Borderlands 2? Oh, okay. Well, but, but, like, yeah, she's been in a a lot of video games and stuff. And then, like, now, like, I mean, she's Molly in uh, The Ghost of Molly McGee. Uh, You know, she's just, like, a ton of random roles that you see here and there kind of reminds me of like Kimiko Glenn where like back in 2017 with DuckTales you know and like into the Spider-Verse and stuff it's like okay she's got like these bit roles yeah yeah I recognize this person huh but then like oh she's Bridget and Close Enough and then you know she's like the main character in the the new Kiff show Ooh. Uh, l- like and is like ho- my favorite horse in Centaur World. Shout out to Centaur World. Uh, you know, make it, make sure to reference that show literally every episode of this show. Uh, but you know, like, she, like I don't know. I just love to see when, like, these sort of voice actors, like, just you see their beginnings and then they just start like popping up here and there, like all over the place, and then you know, yeah. you start to like really appreciate them. 
uh, and they like really expand their role. Somebody who doesn't do that though uh, is Chris Neosi. If you're listening to this, Chris, I'm sorry. Uh, like, I don't know. Your all your voices kind of just sound like you, but yelling, you know, or doing like. Uh, I mean, I guess like his. His Ernesto voice is kind of like a smug, like yeah. His guy. Ernesto voice is really good, but that's just yeah. maybe that's just because I like it, Ernesto. Who knows? Yeah, as long as you're getting work from that, then that's all that matters. That's true. That's true. Uh, but you know, I'm not sure if he's going to be getting much work. Uh. <laughs> I don't know, like how, <laughs> like how much more prolific. I know, like Mob Psycho season three, they were like. They None of the voice actors are retor- returning. No, they kept him. And they just did they keep him? I thought yeah. they like removed everybody. No, they just removed with... Mob from my knowledge. Oh, because okay. Of, like, yeah. He so, was the one speaking. So they out. kept like he's still Reagan. That's that's really funny. Yeah. Uh, that's funny because then Reagan's voice actor in Japan, like they were like, oh, he's unpersoned because he was like doing a whole bunch of shit that we're not going to get into. Oh uh, shit! This... I don't know. Uh, but. <laughs> Is that for season three? Yeah. Uh, so Okay. But yeah, that, uh, I don't know, uh, Reagan, great character, maybe not the best people are voicing him. Yeah, uh, that happens. You know. But, okay, so this episode is kind of action-y, sort of. <laughs> but it's like more cartoony action yeah, than it is like actual. Yeah, more slapsticky sort of action. And, uh, you know, I don't know, it feels like, it's it's so weird. It feels like the other Dave Allegri and Hey Wanley episode that we've done before, like the, the, another big one that we did, was the uh, the one where Ko is helping people in the plaza. Yeah, you're then, everybody's like, sidekick. Yeah, uh, and that one I felt like was like really smartly designed and like paced out. Uh, it felt like the episode was like a complete circle you know, in a way where like these random little things and tasks that he did at the end of the beginning of the episode ended up like coming into play at the end and helping those characters. Uh, and it, it like was tied in a nice little bow that way. Whereas like this one it is like the heroes lose and then KO like, you know, tries to team up with Shannon and Daryl and then they double cross him and then he double, double crosses them uh, and then he comes home, and then Red and Enid are just like vibing. Very, yeah, they're vibing. <laughs> they're watching the sunset. They're they've reached. They have reached Nirvana. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're just like so satisfied and everything. Uh, and it's just like it feels like such a. It reminds me of Adventure Time, you know, because I've been doing like a video series where I'm like going through season by season of Adventure Time and like seeing like man, so many episodes of Adventure Time just like end, just like run into a brick wall and it's just like all right episode's over on to the next one which is not necessarily a bad thing it's just a a funny thing to notice like how few of them have like a full emotional arc of some sort especially because so many cartoons now especially like the disney ones like have morals you know like every episode has like you know, a thing that's happening, a conflict, and then, like, a, some type of, like, moral lesson at the end. Uh, which I don't... You can definitely get away with that, more of this format, where mm-hmm. it's, like, not as much of an overarching and more just, like, episode-by-episode episode mm-hmm. type of format. Yeah, for sure. Like, like, I have no problem with moralizing or anything like that. You know, like, not throwing shade at stuff like uh, Owl House or Amphibia, but even, like, Big City Greens, which is, like less story driven more episodic still like every episode is you know ends with like characters hugging and saying they're sorry to each other and learning a lesson and everything (laughs) was like this episode just is you know all right the fucking box bots are idiots and are going to be fighting with each other you know they're going to be their own demise most of the time because of infighting and then K.O. Red and Enid, you know, they're just hanging out. Well, like, I, uh, I do say, this episode does kind of, like, plant the seed. Well, one, it just introduces Raymond, who will be, like, a reoccurring yeah. character. It just kind of plant the seed for, like, future box focus episodes, where it's mm-hmm. like, oh, the, this is the kind of their shtick, then we can expand on this for later that's episodes. True. Uh, but, like, like, that's true. Because, like, before that's this point... That's future us's problem, not us. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Before this point, they really didn't have any interaction 
yeah uh, you know between like daryl and shannon this is the first time that we see them interacting with each other and it's kind of like a focus episode on them uh as well yeah, and then them Raymond out being and stuff. Yeah, like Daryl or Raymond being thrown in to like screw things up and then like creating like a new dynamic with him. I'm glad that like he was quickly like put on a pedestal and then the pedestal was destroyed, you know? Yeah. Like <laughs> that that's just like a, a funny thing to have, you know, cuz it's so easy like you know, being a fan of Power Rangers and and just Toku and stuff in general, the new general shows up is a huge badass for like a couple episodes, but then they get like a power up are able to easily beat him. And then from that point on, you know, it's no problem. They can just take him down whenever he shows up. Yeah. But uh, Raymond always has a pedestal in my heart, at least. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. (laughs) So I like that this one, like the moment he shows up, He's like, oh, he's badass. He's kicking everybody's ass, yeah. knocking them all over the place. He's and doing then, JoJo poses. And th- yeah, and, and like he doesn't lose his pedestal because the heroes defeat him with a power up. It's just that uh, Boxman is so fickle that the second any of his other children do something that pleases him, he like, you know, points a finger at the other You're one. You're no longer the favorite. Yeah, exactly. So it's just a, a very fun more character driven conflict than it is like power driven uh so yeah i just i think that that was great one last note i want to throw out about this episode uh this is the first time i noticed in the background of boxmore they have those screws from the metropolis zone in sonic 2 you know those annoying oh no <laughs> that you no. have to like run on oh. that like bring you up and down I, yeah i, hate I saw that. us typical ian yeah i'm bringing all these sonic references you know you freaking I, foreshadowing I mean, it i mean like fox yeah. Moore is just a giant robotic eggman homage yeah so. for sure like very like yeah it's just like be like man if i was 12 when the show came out who boy. <laughs> yeah, you just, like, your entire over. face would just be a permanent yeah. soy jack at that point. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. because I think about that, like, you know, obviously the show came out in, like, you know, 2017. So those people that grew up with it aren't old enough to be posters on the internet or making video essays. But I just wonder, what are those kids going to be like, you know? I'm very uh, interested. What, yeah. Bro, those kids are going to be weird. Yeah. <laughs> Cuz this show is just for like in the best way possible. It's both Ian and also just everyone who worked on it. Like they're just all massive nerds. Yeah. And they just put that in here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you mentioned it uh in in a different life, but <laughs> the, the... in a different reality yeah. <laughs> it never happened. But like <laughs> there's so many inside jokes for animation. Uh, nerds and things like that across the show but like even you know like just just like the fact i mean the board driven thing you know that began with i want to say flapjack was kind of the first show that was really like oh yeah every episode looks distinct from one another you know we're not going for like uniformity across the board i would say maybe camp laszlo at the earliest because like you can tell when an episode is bordered by J.G. Quintel. Stuff like that. Yep. You know, uh, but, like, Flapjack for sure was the beginning of that. Then Adventure Time really brought it up another notch. Then Steven. And then this is, like, a different art style, essentially. <laughs> like, every every single episode, depending on who is... And then, bet- like, within episodes, you know, depending on, like, oh, which one of the board partners did this scene, you know? Like, in the next episode we'll be talking about I Am Dendi, like... Mira Antra, very realistic, very like kind of like proportionate art style, um, very like conducive to more serious or more effective emotional scenes. Less so to comedy, and then Geneva, a very squat, sort of round, cutesy uh, art style. Maybe more like classic Sonicy uh, in a lot of ways, and it's like that's more conducive to like cute scenes, to funny scenes, things like that. Uh, and it just, like, goes between the two, like, pretty readily, you know, depending on, you know, who was given a certain section of the episode. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, talking about episode eight, uh, definitely... It is kind of yeah. crazy looking back at OKKO in, like, hindsight, because mm-hmm. it is almost like a, how did they even get away with making this? Yeah. yeah it feel like it was at <laughs> that perfect, like, 
in between point like when animation was like like Car- Cartoon Network, they were like they they basically like were at like like in they're not they weren't at their peak, but they let like these creative things go before like the freaking mm. HBO like AT and T right. Discovery mergers screwed over everything. Um, mm. Yeah, and they definitely got caught in the crossfire. Oh yeah, that, I, like mm. I, I heard like we we'll probably get into this again like down the road, but I heard it was like the AT and T merger basically axed a uh, like half season three of the show yeah 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 i i do remember having a conversation with toby jones at some point about it but i don't remember exactly what it was nor i don't know how much of it is something that should be publicly That's shared true. if it even matters <laughs> but like because I, uh... I do remember him kind of mentioning like yeah it was like we were doing good and then like that merger happened and like hbo max and everything like everything started changing mm. and we just kind of got caught on the chopping Man, block with su- that that sucks so because like there's so many good shows that like would have been fantastic on cartoon network that then got s- completely screwed by being made streaming shows like the fungies excellent show it's not a streaming show though it's a watch an episode a week sort of cartoon you know yeah. it's not right a streaming show take and seek same thing you know Jellystone, maybe because it's like IP based, you know, nostalgia yeah, sort of yeah, stuff. Disgusting words, you know, but like it's a good I, show. I, but like, uh, yeah, I good. love, I love Jellystone, yeah. but it is like clear. It is just like the only reason it got made <laughs> was because it's like, oh yeah, we can. People remember Yogi Bear, right? Yeah, from yeah, that 2011 we'll that. movie and nothing Whereas, else. Like, you know. <laughs> C.H. Greenblatt made, like, a beautiful masterpiece with, uh, you know, Harvey Beaks and Nickelodeon completely fucked that one over. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. I mean, that was just Nickelodeon being there in that weird, like, if anything doesn't live up to SpongeBob right away, we're just yeah. not going to give it. Yeah. We're not going to give it a I chance. Mean, it was super. I remember there was a, a creative block, which is a animation podcast. Ooh. There's an episode. I can't remember. I th- can't remember who exactly it was, but it was a, a producer that was working at Nickelodeon at the time. And he mentioned that like after Harvey Beaks got screwed over, he was like petitioning or like asking Nickelodeon, like, look, you can't do stuff like this anymore. You have to give shows a good runway for success or you're never going to foster another SpongeBob ever again. And then the loud house happened and was immediately huge. And then they're like, no, we were right. You are wrong. Stuff like this, like, we can capture lightning in a bottle, you know, so we just have to, <laughs> <Nickelodeon makes me laughs> like, so it just mad. taught them to ru- like, at the exact worst possible time when they were possibly like, hmm, the sociopathic shareholders at Nickelodeon were like, perhaps we should listen to this guy and, you know, chill out on canceling shows before they reach meteoric success. And then something reaches meteoric success immediately. And then they're like, yep. Uh, I guess we were right all along. Uh, so, uh, no no shade towards the Loud House, even if I don't watch it or anything. It's just, it ended up, uh, you know, prolonging the doom uh, for a lot of shows, Nickelodeon. Then again, I feel like maybe Nickelodeon is... It was already on a pretty big know. downfall. Like, uh, I don't, I I don't want to get not... into, like, the history of, like, the freaking yeah. downfall of Nickelodeon. But, like, yeah, man, I thinking mean, about that network uh, makes me so mad. <laughs> Yeah, th- I mean, I don't know what their numbers look like, but I feel like it's just a matter of, like, they haven't had a new show that's... And part of it is just the fact that they won't commit to anything yeah. that isn't immediately a hit. Yeah. Even, but they just don't have that catalog anymore. Yeah, even Loud House, that was six years ago. Like, like holy shit. <laughs> that, that was so long. And then, like, Cartoon Network, obviously, is kind of in a similar situation where it's like, well, what do they have? Craig of the Creek... That's almost done. We we baby bears. <laughs> That's it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, because that, that Jessica show, I don't know if that will ever exist, oh, honestly, yeah. uh, with all the things behind the scenes. Uh, and then the, all the stuff that's being in production is like, oh, Craig McCracken got his soul uh, battered into submission and is making a new Powerpuff Girls show. Uh, and the new Boston <laughs> for Imaginary just, Friends thing. And, it's it's uh, pissing me I'm off, at least man. glad he got to make Kid Cosmic before... Yeah doing that because it's like all right you got your magnum opus out there great thumbs up you know beautiful show uh now you can go in and do the like fuck it i'm gonna just make a bunch of money 
show here with yeah. Power of Girls. I love. I mean, I love Cartoon Network, so I hope that they do like pick themselves up out of this rut. I think the destruction of all streaming services is going to lead to uh, like a new resurgence of you know sort of creator driven shows. I hope and everything like that. Uh, I mean, that's just a cycle of how art works. Yeah. And Trendy thing It moves happens. out the pipeline. Mm. Yeah. It just moves out the pipeline. It gets into the hands of, like, the most richest, like, least creative-minded people mm-hmm. who are just trying to profit. Mm-hmm. And then, like, eventually it falls apart and then it goes back into the hands of the creative people. Yeah. And, like, you know, like, even if really the only new thing that they have is we baby bears it's a great show oh yeah it's like it's like a fucking yeah. i can't believe how good it looks and how much like effort and everything is put into it uh yeah. and it's just like imagine if we had like five of these and not just the one yeah. <laughs> like imagine if we had many shows with this same level of polish and attention to detail yeah i, I might it. just go like and just binge a bunch of we baby bears after this podcast yeah <laughs> Like, and also seek out illegal downloads of the fungies and... You know, oh, yeah, because those got removed. Ah, uh, thanks, yeah, HBO yeah. And Max. OKKO got, you know, like, the, I have to watch it on Hulu now, so yeah. thanks, guys. I use a, uh, a special means, I say, covering hmm, one eye in a very specific way. <laughs> yeah, actually, very funny. Ever since I started making videos, there's been a, a website that just hosts 1080p rips of OKKO, OK and I don't think it's taken down. I don't. I seriously don't think that they've taken it down. Yeah. You know, like that. Uh, there's they a, probably just don't care. Honestly. Yeah. I th- there's one for Steven as well. Ooh. Uh, hey, know, thanks for sharing. Like, I might. Do you know, that. All, all six of the seasons. You know, in like 1080p. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. yeah. Streaming services <laughs> suck. Uh, I hate Nickelodeon. <laughs> Cartoon Network. You're on. Please get better. Yeah. Like Nickelodeon. I feel like it's really sad to say uh but disney is in the best position out of all of them you know and they still screw things up yeah i I mean yeah but like they they have like a future (laughs) you know some type of like bright future ahead of them where it's like it's hard to see a future for nickelodeon and cartoon network Right now, I'm sure eventually things will get better. I'm not so pessimistic that I think it's going to be doom and gloom forever. But it, it like Disney, you know, I, the only thing that like disappoints me about them is that like, oh, they have a big new show. What is it? It's based on a comic book, you know, like uh, the Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Looks fantastic though, so I'm glad it at least has that. It looks better than that god-awful fucking spider-man show ah don't remind uh, me made, oh. you know, <laughs> like back in like well, 2018 isn't that partly because it's a like usually the marvel stuff is made by marvel studios whereas mm-hmm. like moon girl and devil sword is actually at disney tv i believe so yeah. yeah i think that it is so that's probably what it is yeah they, they have like character people with like design and know-how like i think like it's mostly like oh man yeah marvel all those shows just suck so bad uh, like the, I was so excited for a Guardians of the Galaxy show, uh, and then I don't was just remind like a me. Uh, I tried watching it. I couldn't even garbage. get past an episode. It was so bland. Yeah. It's just like there's no toast. Yeah, or there's no flavor. But th- <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, anyway, okay, KO. Oh yeah, we, uh, we th- went this a episode. Big <laughs> there. Huh. This episode, I am Dendi. You know, I re- like Dendi. I love her as a character. You know, just a very cute. Uh, I like the nerdy, you know, yeah. like tech genius sort of characters. Nerdy scrimblo. Um, yeah. Implied neurodivergence. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, <laughs> like I actually when I first watched this episode back in 2017, I was like, oh, is that Paradot doing the, <laughs> the voice? But no, it is not. It's a different uh, voice actress. But it's same character it, archetype. Yeah, very very similar. Yeah, Paradot's just like more ornery. You know, I like. I like her a little bit more because she has that spice in her, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, like, one of my favorite characters in Dragon Ball is Bulma because she's she's the tech genius, but she's also, like, an amoral, <laughs> you know, like, she, she... Girl boss. Yeah, she uses a child and exploits him many times throughout the first arc, and she uses her sexuality to get her way, and all these, like, there's so many, like, fun wrinkles uh, to her character 
that move her away from just being like the tech girl, the smart one, you know? Man, I really need to go back and watch the OG Dragon Ball because yeah. it's been gotta do it. Like, it's good I've been reading the manga and it's good time. shit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I say go ahead yeah. and, and either get on that Shonen Jump app and read. Or, you know, uh, I mean... Not reading. I know. <laughs> what are these words Horrible. that you speak Who of? Who is that? Who is this? Stefan King? <laughs> hmm, never heard of him. Uh, but this episode does have, like, even if it is not, like, the funniest episode, it is more like uh It's very sort of heartfelt. Downbeat, sort of, yeah, it's heartfelt. There is, like, one very funny joke in it, in that there's a great twist on the, like... Oh, a person without money opens up their wallet and then moths fly out. Where Ko like looks into his pocket for money and then moths fly out and then Ko's <laughs> like, "Oh no, my moth collection!" <laughs> and that's just like that's just a dumb <laughs> joke that okay, I really well, enjoy. It's very okay. Ko yeah. have his moth collection. He's just that guy, you know. Yeah, uh, and then like I don't know, j- just like the the way that the it felt like the first time since, like, the first episode of the show uh, that, like, 100% tried to be, like, like filled with emotionality or, like, to have some type of, you know, I'm not saying it, like, brought me to tears or whatever necessarily, but it was like, oh, it was a very heartwarming episode as opposed to the, the last one we watched, which was, you know, very wacky, very funny, you know, all visual gags, all, like characters being mean and horrible to each other and posing funnily uh, yeah <laughs> i definitely appreciate the fact that like i don't know what i would attribute this to exactly but it's kind of like just respecting the audience's intelligence where there was like clearly a misdirection in the facts that dendy was trying to take advantage of ko mm-hmm. in a way where it's like she was leading him on this like long goose chase yeah. because she wanted a friend and it was, like, in a lot of cartoons, they'll do that, and then, like, it's like, oh, you were deceiving me, but K.O.'s just like, oh, well, you clearly just wanted a friend, yeah. so, like, I'm not gonna be mad about that. I love that. I, like, one, because it just makes K.O. a more likable character, because he's understanding. Yeah. And two, yeah. yeah, it's doing something new and fresh with that idea. Uh, uh, you know, this is a, a, maybe a weird example, but, <laughs> but, like, anybody who's seen the Netflix show Kipo... Uh, there's a moment in the second season where she learns that she's essentially a science experiment by her parents. Mm-hmm. And it, it, like any other show, that would be like an existential crisis and she would like have conflicted feelings about her parents. But as soon as she learns, she's like, that's awesome. I can turn into a monster. That's so sick. You know, and I'm like, yeah, that's how I would react <laughs> to this knowledge, you know, like because writer brain poisons you and it's like of course every single twist has to lead to conflict and you have to ring the conflict for every like drop but sometimes it's just more satisfying to like like when you're subverting somebody's expectations okay. uh, this is right <laughs> this is writing advice given by brandon sanderson uh you don't like when a kid is expecting hot wheels and is also a huge fan of mario Ooh. And then you give him socks for his for Christmas, he's gonna be like, "What the fuck?" You know, like he expected Hot Wheels or Mario, but he got socks. That subverted his expectations, but it's disappointing. But if you're like, "Aha! I'm gonna give you a Mario themed Hot Wheels toy for Christmas," you've subverted his expectations and gave him something more that he didn't know that he wanted. What about Mario themed so- socks? That's you know that that would also be a good, <laughs> good thing, the, the shaped like his boots. Uh, do you see that they're making his? Oh yeah, like the Mario's first... boots real products yeah. now. Do you wanna who? That's yeah. That's something that's kind of tough to do as a writer mm. though. And oh, that's for something sure. That I think that I think a lot of like people who are like, I mean nowadays like with social media, everyone considers themselves a media critic. Mm. But I think that. Part of being a great writer or great entertainer or whatever is, like, you can't just be like, okay, I'm going to give people what they want or, like, subvert expectations. You have to kind of predict, like, why are people not 
aware of that they want exactly like what is something that they're not going to realize how bad they want it until you give it to them yeah and like that's a really difficult thing to do but if you can pull that off then yeah you're in a good spot yeah. and like you don't have to do it 100 percent of the time right sometimes you can just yeah. be like i genuinely think people that complain about like predictability uh, in stories yeah. is like that's super annoying because it's like yeah sometimes like the predictable thing you just it's just simple you just want it you know it's fine to be unpredictable uh and that can sometimes be fun in its own right but sometimes it can just be like frustrating and like feel like you're bouncing back and forth here and there you know so yeah like sometimes you just want your presence under a christmas tree exactly sometimes uh, you don't so, want to like, be you know punched you're in the face him, by saying but... it's in <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly uh but i don't know the like so that sort of thing where ko is like oh it's no hard feelings dendy was like working yourself up over it you know and felt like ashamed by it and then the fact that like you know that kind of functions as the moral lesson that i was talking about with like some other cartoons yeah. uh and then the episode ending sort of like on the button of like them looking at their pow cards yeah. uh as a kid who played Yu-Gi-Oh obsessively uh you know I, I always, there's just, like, so much serotonin that goes into my brain looking through another person's collection of cards just to see, like, oh, man, you have this thing? Or, like, sometimes seeing things I've never even heard of and then being like, whoa, I want that. That looks cool. You know, uh, so, yeah, very, very touching, very wholesome uh, overall, you know. Like, one other thing. I want to point out, and I have no no problems with shippers, right? Uh, but I I do really like how throughout the entire show, Ko and Dendi are never like treated as a romantic couple, and it's never like really teased or or anything in that way. Uh, I think maybe because they're like too young, really, for th those stories or anything. But like, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe it's because I'm watching. Uh, star versus the force of evil currently ah. but like it's so yeah. it was even when that show began i was like yeah no shit star and marco are going to get together so like i didn't finish the show or i haven't got around to finishing the show until very recently uh so like when it ended and i learned that people were pissed off about the ending i didn't know the full context so it's just like oh people are pissed off about the obvious thing happening like what's i don't know whatever uh, but yeah. like now watching the show, I'm like, oh my god, they had so many right. opportunities to take this in a more interesting direction, and they just keep on backtracking and keep on like ringing it out, you know? Uh, yeah, it it wasn't really done well as the main thing. Yeah, it, and like especially because they got to a point where Star and Marco felt really satisfying as just friends. Yes, like it was really satisfying to see like just a good like male and female relationship mm -hmm. among like. Like, what is traditionally used as like a very romance heavy like age group yeah in media and like and then to just have that be like psych yep now they're they're gonna get together it's like ah oh, come on tom is so good and uh not you but the character <laughs> well you're good too, <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but the the tom uh, lucifer yeah. the the character the devil uh it, it's so great and as well as like his friendship with like not only his relationship with star but his friendship with marco uh, is so great and then like the the you know f cumulative 50 seconds or whatever that they put into uh developing marco and kelly also very good so <laughs> it's just sad that it will eventually i haven't gotten to the ending yet but the fact that 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 sort of damocles is like hanging over my head you know yeah. but then i think of stuff like oh steven that introduced connie super early on it was very obvious that they're going for like oh, Steven has a crush on this girl, mm -hmm. you know, like right from the first yeah. episode that she's introduced. But I never felt that that was like annoying. Uh, maybe because it was just yeah. like so straightforward and it was just like, it was yeah, cute. <laughs> you know, we're just like handling this, you know, with that, that's, you know, that, that intentionality of like, yeah, well, this will eventually be a thing by the end. You know? And the thing with that too is like the, like the tension wasn't the will they won't they when they eventually got to, future mm. the tension was actual like interpersonal like okay like how do we make this work yeah. we're growing up we're changing like yeah how is our dynamic going to evolve you're going off and making new friends mm -hmm. and that was like a very real look and i feel like that's 
that's like the real thing that's an issue with the will they won't they i think it's totally fine i'm a big fan of miraculous sure. i'm a big fan of like in my last Sugma Mail video, I talked about Ranma one half, and oh, that's yeah. just a giant mm -hmm. will they, won't they that's never resolved. Yeah. So like I, I get the appeal yeah, of that. It's fun. But part of like what that leads to desire is like there are actual issues that come up when you end up with your friend and yeah. like you have to like navigate like, okay, how are we gonna actually deal with some of the changes and everything that happened mm. there? I think like the romantic relationships that do exist in OKKO like handle it beautifully like uh in season two we'll get to that but with uh gar and gar carol like the fact that they start dating and it's like kind of like what at first but then like the characters don't change they don't become less funny or less interesting they become more interesting and the dynamic changes like the way that the characters approach the world in interesting and new fun ways yeah, and you it doesn't, know, like, like, lock their personality to the person they're in a relationship yeah. with. They still, like, get to have their own adventures. It just adds, here's yes, another exactly. layer to them. Yeah, there's plenty of episodes where it's just, like, KO with Gar or KO with Carol or things like that, you know? Uh, like, and what I'm saying is I have no issue with the idea of shipping with uh, KO and Dendi, for example. But, like, I think it's a refreshing you know, change of pace that they're able to have such a sweet episode like this and continue to build upon this relationship and have them being, like, very loving and affectionate towards each other without ever, like, even dangling the carrot of, like, a romantic relationship in front of your nose. Yeah. You know? It's just, like, right. they're just, like, really good friends. You know? And it's just, like, their friendship continues to develop. And if you want to see it as one thing, then go ahead. But, like, they don't they sort of don't dangle that carrot in front of you and then they don't have like multiple episodes where like oh maybe ko has a crush on this girl and then dendy is jealous and blah blah, blah. you know like that doesn't happen thankfully so okay. thumbs up to this <laughs> i'm i want to say it's because this episode was boarded by you know like a woman and a non-binary person so it was like oh they're they're more sensitive to those annoying <laughs> proclivities of like yeah. male writers, you know? Yeah. So, but I think like in general, just the DNA of the show, like I think everybody was on the same page, yeah. you know, with, with they that know what's decision. Up. So, yeah. But uh, before we go though, one, just like two more things I want to mention. This is the first time Glorbs are mentioned. Oh yeah. Show. And it's the first time we see professor venomous. Yeah, the card. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Like, it's pull, pulled out. Venomous will be introduced properly in a few episodes. Uh, and, I, like, K.O.'s thumb is, like, conveniently over his rating, like, his power level. <laughs> that's um, fun. So, like, like, I think that's to obscure the fact that when we see, like, you know, <laughs> spoilers for OK K.O., when we see, like, Shadowy Figure and Laser Blast and have cards of those, and they all have the same value... To, what you know but yeah wait are you implying something there i, I might be i oh well, yeah they know. did reveal that in season three which tom hasn't yeah. finished <laughs> no, oh, I know okay. oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah i think it's one of those twists that it's not about what it is but like how it is yeah you know it, like it, where it's like they even kind of lampshade how obvious it is but even so it's very still well done yeah it's it's about like how are they the same person? You know, like, yeah. like that's, and then like you slowly learn about that throughout the third season. But uh, anyway, I just spoiled the shit out of the, I mean, eh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I made a spoiler warning. You could have skipped ahead 30 seconds. Anyway, yeah, it's like a four, five, I don't know yeah. time anymore. It, it's been six year old. Show. Yeah. Yeah. And even yeah. then it doesn't take uh, that twist too like, it, it still treats it like a big reveal, but it doesn't, t doesn't like treat it like you need to be like, you need That's to true. like be like not spoiled on it to have the full impact. Mm. It's it's pretty well telegraphed. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't right, even say so... telegraphed. I just said smack to the face. It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so that was uh, this week's episode of Lakewood Podcast Turbo. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. You want to tell everybody? Thank you for having me. You want to tell everybody where we can find you so that they can go follow you on the social medias. You can follow me basically anywhere on the internet at TommyPQM, including YouTube, and you can also find my YouTube channel, Sugma Mail. That's Sugma mm -hmm. and Mail, just <laughs> on YouTube. 
<laughs> Such a good name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, Buster, where can we find you? Oh, hi. Uh, welcome to the channel that's probably hosting this, because I think we agreed we could put the episodes on my channel. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll put them, uh, and on Anchor. Yeah, you know, I, I, yeah we'll but if on... either of you're listening on yeah. Anchor or you're watching on my channel, hi, I'm Buster Corp. I do too many Tokusatsu videos for my own good. I just, like, mm. at the time of writing, that will probably be like a month old by the time you're listening. I just did a Kamen mm. Rider 1971 video, so if you want to learn cool. the origins of of Kamen Rider, uh, go watch that. Ooh. I'm also doing a bunch of other podcasts over at Modular Media. We cover every episode of the Kamen Rider and Super Sentai shows week to week. Uh, I don't. It, this comes out in April. What's happening then? Mm. I don't know. The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers reunion special. We'll probably cover that soon. Sure. Uh, we also do like sure. <laughs> shit posty podcasts of just like us basically in a wrestling match. It's it's a fun time over there. So if you like my voice in audio form. Go to those mm. links over there. I'm also on Twitter yeah. at BusterBlade3 where I retweet too much things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you do retweet too many I'm things. I'm sorry. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but yeah, you can find me at uh, twitter.com slash wasranger. That's W-A-Z-P Ranger. We also just stream of consciousness stuff. But you can find updates and new videos that I'm releasing and new things related to this podcast. But if you're interested in my videos then go on over to It's Only Magic, YouTube.com. Yes, I did name my channel after OKKO. Uh, I recently did, as in like a year ago, <laughs> did a video that's a huge retrospective on OKKO. I've done a bunch of other stuff uh, on the channel, uh, videos on some of my favorite shows like uh, Gurren Lagann, stuff like Wander Over Yonder, Megas XLR, Homestar Runner, Board James... Just a bunch of wacky stuff. If you want to go over there, check it out, please. And then, uh, for some reason, my Tiny Toons video is probably, like, the most active. Like, so many people. Like, once a week, at least. And I'm a small channel. Uh, so, like, under a 1,000 subscribers. Um, once a week, there's somebody that comes in and leaves a comment on that Tiny Toons video. And, like, complains about something that I said or says uh, Kennedy Tunes is actually a good animation studio or whatever. They're wrong, uh, <laughs> but whatever. Uh, if you are a fan of uh, Explode When Defeated or Discuss All Monsters, those podcasts, and you're here for me and for that, Patreon is up. It's you free admittance. You know, just go in. I won't charge any money for it. You know, it is just left up for everybody, you know, to come and go as they please. Uh, and hey, we if you're interested after watching uh, Buster's video on the original Kamen Rider, we have a 13 episode series on uh, the original Kamen Rider. Uh, so hey, we're even talking about the manga. So check that one out. Uh, anyway, man, that was this week's episode. Join us next time as we talk about episodes 9 and 10. See you there. in school. I've noticed things that would threaten the average person have little to no effect on you. An example. One time the bus broke down on our trip to the zoo. Our peers were unsettled, but you were just excited to see a tow truck in action. Uh, yeah, because tow trucks are the most heroic vehicles. <laughs>